Namaste. So last time we went through the invocation to Aparokshanubhuti. This time we'll begin the first section, which is about the qualifications for Atma Vichara. Uh, this scripture gets right down to business, so let's be the same and just jump right in. Aum Aparokshanubhutirvai Prochate Moksha Siddhaye Sadbhiresha Prayatnena Vikshaniya Muhur Muhu Aparokshanubhutihi The means of attaining to self realization. Va, emphatic particle. Prochate is spoken of in detail. Moksha Siddhaye for the acquisition of final liberation from the bondage of ignorance. Sadbihi by the pure in heart. Esha only. Prayatnena with all effort. Vikshaniya should be meditated upon. Muhur muhuhu again and again. Herein is indeed expounded Aparokshanubhutihi, the means of attaining to self realization, for the acquisition of final liberation. Only the pure in heart should constantly and with all effort meditate upon the truth herein taught. So the first point that Aparokshanubhutihi makes is that one should be pure in heart. In other words, one should be qualified. Not that one is chasing after the sense objects in the material world. Not that one is addicted to mental speculation and philosophical arguments. But that one actually practices the life of liberation. Mumukshu, one has great desire for liberation and is willing to give up anything that becomes an obstacle on that path. So then, what are these qualifications? And how can we give them up? Well, this is what the first section of this work discusses in detail. So let's look at the next verse and then summarize the qualifications for the path. Svavarnashramadharmena tapasaharitoshanat sadhanam prabhavet pungsang vairagyadi chatushtayam Svavarnashramadharmena by the performance of duties pertaining to one's social order and stage in life. Tapasa, by austerity. Haritoshanat, by satisfying Lord Hari. Sadhanang, the means to self-realization. Prabhavet, arises. Pungsang, of men. Vairagyadi, vairagya, dispassion, etc. Chatushtayam, the fourfold. The four preliminary qualifications, the means to the attainment of knowledge, such as vairagya, dispassion, and the like, are acquired by men by propitiating Lord Hari through austerities and the performance of duties pertaining to their social order and stage in life. So in a few minutes, I'm going to summarize 
these four preliminary qualifications. But first I want to explain the means by which they are attained. Three are given here. By propitiating Lord Hari. Now Hari refers to Vishnu. Vishnu is the deva of the mode of goodness, Sattva Guna. And Sattva Guna is described in Bhagavad Gita as being purer than the rest. And it is defined as actions and attitudes that lead towards liberation. So in other words, those things that lead us away from the material world and towards liberation are considered to be in the mode of goodness, sattva. And these are the elements of sadhana. What are they? Well, propitiation of Lord Hari means puja. We should worship the Lord in whatever form we choose. Because all the different forms of the demigods and gods are ultimately one, Brahman. So whichever our Ishta Devata happens to be, we should offer that deity regulated offerings in terms of a light, water, incense, flowers, food, and other nice offerings, along with appropriate prayers. We've gone over that in the series on spiritual nourishment. So that should be old hat by now. Then there's performance of austerities. Austerity means celibacy, first of all, and then control of the diet. Very important. You are what you eat. You know, I, in India when, and elsewhere, people eat so much chicken, they start even sounding like chickens. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. Or in Western countries, the heavy meat eaters you actually start to look and sound like cows because you are what you eat. In any case, the fear poisons released into the bloodstream of the animal at the time when it is brutally slaughtered create all kinds of havoc with the endocrine system and lead to diseases like heart disease and cancer and so on. So one should avoid this nonsense. And what to speak of intoxication like liquor and cigarettes and drugs. So these are austerities. And then there's rising early in the morning, doing meditation, hatha yoga, remaining alone, isolated, reclused, and so many other uh, austerities, tapasa, described in the scriptures. One should perform these. And finally, uh, the performance of Varnashram Dharma. Now, Varnashram Dharma is uh, disappearing fast, even in India. But what it basically means is that there are four occupational divisions. Brahmana, or the priestly class. Kshatriya, or the ruler class, administrative class. Vaishya, or the commercial tradesmen and shudras, or workers. If you have a job, you're a shudra. So we can understand that more than 90% of the population is basically shudra. If you're a business owner, then you're a business class person. If you're in the government, or if you're a soldier, you're a kshatriya. And if you're a priest or scholar, you're a brahmana by occupation. Then there are the four stages of life. Brahmachari, which is celibate student life. Unfortunately, these days, students are anything but celibate, which means they really don't retain much of what they learn. Then um, Brahmachari, Vanaprastha, which is a householder, family person. 
raising children, keeping a wife and house. And then vanaprastha, which means retired life, where one is supposed to go to the forest with one's wife or not <laughs> and perform austerities. And finally, sannyasa, or complete renunciation. And these are the four orders of spiritual life. So then, what are the qualifications that we gain by this type of activity? Well, let's look into it. Now, first of all, these qualifications are discussed in Aparokshanubhuti, verses 3 through 10. And they are, first of all, vairagya, indifference to objects of enjoyment. Vairagya is sometimes translated renunciation, but it's more than that. It's not just an external action of giving things up, but it's an attitude to where one becomes different to objects of enjoyment that are temporary, imperfect, and not self. Because the real object of enjoyment is the self. The enjoyment that one gets from meditation on the self is, first of all, unconditional. It can be enjoyed in any condition or state of life. It is permanent, eternal. Nothing can interrupt it, not even death. It is pure consciousness and it is pure enjoyment without any end or limitation. So to give up uh, external sense objects of pleasure and focus within on the self in meditation is true vairagya. Next is viveka, discrimination between the seer and the seen. We discuss this in detail in our series on Drig Drishya Vivekaha. Drig Drishya Vivekaha elaborates on the distinction between the seer or consciousness, the self, the subject, and the objects or the various sense objects in the material world. So I'm not going to discuss that in detail here, but one should just be able to see the difference and identify only with the seer and not the seen, which means to give up identification with the body and mind. Then there are the six treasures. Shama means abandonment of desires. Dhamma means restraint of the external sense organs. Uparati means turning away from all sense objects. Titiksha means patient endurance of sorrow and pain. Shraddha means implicit faith in the Vedas and the Guru. And Samadhana means concentration of the mind on Brahman. These are all going to be discussed in detail in the following shlokas. So I'm not going to go into them now. And the final quality is mumukshuta, a burning desire for mukti, or liberation. This desire for mukti should become the dominant motivation and psychological force in one's life. Everything should be subordinated to it. And why is that? In the human form of life alone, one has the facility to attain liberation. Even the demigods envy human beings on planet Earth because we have all the requisite qualifications or situation. It's not too enjoyable here, and it's not too hellish here. It's somewhere in the middle. So one can actually detach and focus the mind on Brahman, the self. 
In the heavenly planets, the demigods are so overwhelmed with enjoyment, they don't have time for anything else. Plus, even there, there are so many anxieties like attacks from the demons and so on. So that's not a good place for meditation. And what to speak of the hellish planets, which are like the terrible dictatorships that we see on this earth, multiplied a thousand times. These are the worlds of the demons. So we don't want to go there either. Those people have no scope for introspection or meditation. But in the human form of life on planet Earth, we're right in the middle. It's not too good, it's not too bad. Our life is not too short, and not too long. Our intelligence is enough, but not too much, <laughs> so that we don't get lost in the world of the mind. Well, of course, some people do, but that's their problem. What human life gives is the chance to remain motivated by the goad of suffering, but not so overwhelmed by suffering that it's impossible to concentrate the mind. Because the mind has to be concentrated to overcome the illusion, maya, and realize Brahman. And what is this realization of Brahman? Well, most of us consider that our self or our consciousness is within the body, within the mind. In other words, the mind and body cover our consciousness and give us a sense of limitation, individuality, identity, and so on. But actually, it's not true. Actually, it's just an illusion. Maya, that which is not. What really is the case is that the mind and the body are within the self. In other words, it's just inside out. Not that the self is within the body. The body is within the self. And along with the body, the senses and the mind, which means the world. And the proof of this is that when consciousness changes at night, when we go to sleep, the world disappears. The body also disappears. And we get an, a new body in dreams, a new world, a new cast of characters. And then even that disappears when we go into deep sleep. So all of these temporary things are within consciousness, not that consciousness is within them. Because consciousness remains steady, even though these various sense objects and worlds and so on, bodies and so on, disappear regularly. But because we've been told a story and we believe that story, that I am so and so and my body is myself, and my mind is who I am and what I think. But it's not true. This is maya. This is the illusion. See, maya means false promises, misinformation, falsehoods, lies. So we've been lied to. And we have to see through that. And the way to do that is to just look. Just look with an open mind and you'll see the body disappears at night. We get another body in a dream. Then that body disappears and there's nothing. And then the reverse happens on waking up. So what is real? Only consciousness. Because only consciousness truly exists and is changeless and supreme. This knowledge, this view, is really the qualification for enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.